This is Pat Salber with the Dr. Ways In, and we're going to have an amazing conversation because I have with me John Madison, who's a physician and the CHIO, which is a new term for me because we used to say CMIO, so chief medical, but because you're from Kaiser, it's chief health information officer, which is very cool. Congratulations Thank on you. that. And he just gave an incredible talk about artificial intelligence, and I could call it the good, the bad, and the ugly, but it was the good, the bad, and the really, really, really ugly, scary stuff. And so what we're going to talk about is we're going to start out by saying, yes, the power of AI. There is so many amazing things that artificial intelligence is going to do for us, um, but there is a downside. So, John, um, tell me a little bit about the good stuff, but then, uh, not that I want to scare the bejesus out of everyone, but you did that to me. And w then I want to talk about some of the bad stuff. And then we're going to wrap up by talking about what we should do about it, what all of us should know, and what we should do about it. Take sure. it away. Sure, thanks. Well, the very first thing that I, I like to start off with before I get into the bad stuff is to say that um, machine learning in particular, which is, which is a very well described technology as opposed to AI, which is still kind of elusive as, as a construct, um, and particularly artificial generalized intelligence or AGI, but machine learning uh, has already delivered tremendous benefit. And, and if you look at the limitations of the human brain and how much data you can wrap your brain around and how many algorithms you can run against that data um, in a nanosecond, uh, the machine beats the human easily. We already know uh, that the machine is better than the human for playing chess, uh, AlphaGo, um, and um, one by one, we're, we're developing capabilities to exceed the computational and the, 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 the data ingestion of the human brain. And so the power for that is going to be very per pervasive in a very positive way. Everything everything will eventually be informed by machine learning because it's adaptive and, and you can be constantly improving whatever service or whatever product based upon large amounts of data uh, and, and using machine learning to do that. And so the power of it is quite good. But so I am going to give you that. I will grant you that. I think everybody listening to us or watching us will grant you that. Um, but now there there's, are some. There's a dark side. Yeah. So take us through the dark side, and maybe give us three or four concrete examples um, of of how this could all go terribly wrong, and then we'll talk about what we think we can do collectively to try and alter that course or prevent it from happening. Sure. And and I will I will gladly talk about some of the dark side, not deliberately to scare and incapacitate people, but to motivate all of us to be very wary of the dark side so we can do something about it. And that's what Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking have been doing for a number of years, is sounding the alarm bells, not to say don't use AI, quite the contrary. Um, Tesla is built on a lot of AI, and a lot of what Elon Musk is working on is built on machine learning. Uh, but he is on the bleeding edge, and so he sees the dark side as I see the dark side, and there are those who poo-poo it as not being substantial. Here's why it's real. There are, the human brain has well-studied, well-known systematic biases and, and haphazard biases as well, of cognitive bias, and there's a long list that we know about but we don't pay that close attention to, quite honestly. And there's great books written about how medical decision making goes awry because of the, the biases within the human brain. There is nothing different about the machine and its biases that are intrinsic, except for the fact that there's less transparency today. There's a lot of work going on to bring more transparency into the black box of machine learning. But there's still a lot of opacity into what actually happens between the data input and the recommended output. And so one of the biggest risks is that people who don't pay close attention to how closely the train, you, a machine learning neural net has virtually no value until you train it on a set of data. So what is a common uh, misunderstanding is that once you train a particular neural net on a large data set that you're done and you can go apply it anywhere. There are all kinds of reasons why you're just starting the journey with that initial training. And the biggest caveat is that if you, for example, train a neural net 
how to diagnose and how to make recommendations for treating breast cancer based upon um, a training data set that, that came from a population of women 50 years and older that were at risk of breast cancer, had breast cancer, and then you start applying it to women under the age of 50, it neglects the fact that the biology and the characteristics and the distribution frequencies of different types of breast cancer in those under 50 is different than those over 50. And so a mistake would be to rely on the machine to diagnose and treat someone under the age of, advise on the treatment of someone under the age of 50 when the training set was all women over the age of 50. That's kind of an extreme example um, and it illustrates the point. But what is much more subtle and much more pervasive has been the subject of two really excellent books. The first one by Kathy O'Neill called Weapons of Math Destruction, which I highly encourage people to read, which talks about the nuanced, subtle biases that can be introduced and then replicated at scale. So the difference between the cognitive bias that any one of us has in our own mental processing is that we're an N of one and we generally impact decisions in our own life. But when you put a very powerful tool that can ingest massive quantities of information and generate tons of advice for millions of people, you're compounding the risk of those intrinsic biases and unless you're aware of them, it can be a real problem. One, one example I'll give is what's called an interventional paradox. And the interventional paradox refers to the fact that if you train the machine on a set of data and then you apply that machine to a very similar set of data, but you've already learned from the analysis of your first data set, so you do an intervention. And you apply that intervention before you do the machine learning on the second data set. What can happen is that through that intervention, you have fundamentally changed the data, the data itself in ways that are unknown to that machine learning stack that was trained without that intervention. So I'll give a, a, an example. Why was it so obvious to Nate Silver um, who was going to win the election and why was he so, the last election and why was he so wrong? Well, the premise of the analytics applied was that you want to look at people likely to vote and you want to target people likely to vote for your analysis of who's going to win the election. And what happened is one of the candidates chose to target people who were unlikely to vote. That's an intervention. And so applying those same analytics and algorithms to a set of data where a different intervention based upon prior learning had been applied invalidated the utility of that tool. Um, and that was partially of consequence in the outcome of the election. So there are many other um, examples that are well documented about the intervention paradox, but that's just one of them. Another example would be that um, when you use um, artificial intelligence, for example, for autonomous drone fleets, you can do some really cool stuff. You can, you can mass customize how you assess an agricultural situation and how you remediate an agricultural, agricultural a problem either associated with drought or nutrient deficiencies or whatever, or you can arm those drones and launch them and have them target a specific human target or population and only the people who have designed the autonomy and the machine learning of those drones have any control over what happens. And so there, there is an imminent risk of there being a new form of warfare associated with uh, auto armed autonomous drones. So my mind could go a lot of weird places with that. One is that we could have a war of drones, and, and the war could be the drones versus a certain set of human beings. The other is, um, let's say I wanted to take out my enemies, I could have a very targeted way of taking out my individual enemies Absolutely. one at a time. So that's pretty scary. You, you also... With facial recognition being what it is, that's not science fiction. Right, I want to get that guy. Right. Um, you also talked about something else that, that really made me nervous, and that was this whole idea of being Sorry, able to... I come back to that, though? Because absolutely. I, I do believe the reason that, that others have called this out, I, I, this, is, this is not my observation. There are many other people who have called out the dangers of these autonomous armed drones. The reason that I echo their concern is because if we take action as a global citizenry and 
pass treaties just like we have in the Geneva Convention uh, and in other conventions against chemical warfare and nuclear warfare and biologic warfare, we can really mitigate that risk. So the scary side of this is very scary, and yet we are slow to embrace the kinds of policy interventions and treaties that are necessary to mitigate those risks. And the problem is with exponential technologies, the pace of technologic evolution and implementation vastly exceeds the pace of policy making, particularly in the highly conflicted world we have today in polarized politics. So we need to be very, very thoughtful and determined not to be um, uh, incapacitated by concern, but to be motivated to take action on some of these issues. Yeah, so, so that's interesting because that's one where you have a scary example and you can come up with something, a treaty that might be able to mitigate it. But one of the other things that you talked about was um, that there's now technology that can read people's minds and that somewhere on the near horizon, there's also either working on or, or technolo nascent technology that can actually put thoughts into my mind. Uh, that's really scary. And how you would counter that um, seems much more elusive to me. It is, and like any new technology, there's potential for great good and potential for great harm. And so, um, as I mentioned in my talk, there's, there's a series of human rights that are being developed specifically around that problem. Um, the right not to be required to submit yourself to a device that you can wear and can read your thoughts. And this is, again, it's not, sci it's not science fiction. But it sounds like science fiction. But, but, but it's happening today. And there are some brilliant people with very, very good intentions um, and very good use cases about how these can be used to help treat people with various kinds of brain disorders to be able to read um, what is going on in their brain at, at, at incredible levels of detail that could be very helpful for monitoring therapeutic process and so forth. Obviously, the downside is, this, is the dystopian science fiction that has been written about and, and the subject of several sci-fi movies where it's used for evil purposes, to, for mind control. And so to the extent that um, we are aware of the dangers of these powerful technologies that are racing ahead at, at, at a blazing pace to be able to read and ultimately to write thoughts to our brains, we need to be active in understanding the ethical dilemmas and resolving some of the policy issues associated with when can it be used, under what circumstances, under what kind of review, prospectively, real time, and after the fact. So um, it is scary, um, and the people who were pioneering this field are not naive to that. They are calling out these risks as well. In fact, one of the pioneers, Mary Lou Jepson, uh, organized a session at last year's South by Southwest on ethical concerns of exactly what she was doing, specifically because she is very, very conscious of the fact that it could be abused uh, and that we need to be very cognizant of that. So, so we put together a taxonomy of some of the concerns and some of the policy issues that we related to how um, those risks can be mitigated. So let's wrap this up um, by taking a step past the pioneers, the Elon Musks, maybe yourself, the Jepson that you just talked about, who are starting to call this out. And, and talk just for a few minutes about what the average guy can do when they become aware, guy or woman can do when they become aware of this. Um, I'm not gonna make that my life's issue, uh, but I think it's important enough that I would spend some time. How can you, how can you focus our, our energies on being sure that we can join the chorus to ensure that this stuff goes down the right path and not the wrong path? I, th I think there's two primary mechanisms. The first is to have a much uh, more robust educational system about some of these issues very early on. And I'm myself concerned about the extreme focus on STEM education right now because uh, there are going to be fewer and fewer people who create more and more powerful tools and there'll be more and more people sort of left in the dust if they're studying STEM and they're second tier or third tier programmers as one example. Um, we need to emphasize the humanities more now than ever, uh, philosophy, sociology, ethics, um, from an, a young age so that people can understand that there are trade-offs involved. And, and lots of the ancient philosophers focused a lot of their work 
on um, really teasing apart what happens when you have two virtues that are in conflict or three virtues that are in conflict or where there's specific trade-offs. And if you ask five different people how they would rank different virtues in a particular situation, you may get five different answers, let alone at the level of a culture or a country or a, a corporate culture. Um, there, there, there isn't a single right ethical answer. So what we need to do is we need to educationally prepare people to be openly thoughtful about what the trade-offs are so that they're better prepared to address some of these issues as they arise. The second thing that I believe we need to do is we need to, with that better base of education about what these issues are with all these emerging technologies, um, is to expose the concerns and ensure that those who we elect to serve us in public office are A, themselves informed, B, transparent about what their beliefs are, and C, dedicated to responding to the body politic in a way that doesn't reflect the 1%, but reflects a broader segment of the population. We can't do that unless we have the educational foundation in the first place. Wow, well, so uh, fantastic, John. And when you were talking about education, I thought, wow, that, that's something really huge. But I actually think that your second uh, thing that we need to do is even bigger. Um, and that's the subject of another conversation. So I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us and for helping to raise um, our awareness of not just the fantastic, wonderful things that AI is going to do, but also how this could all go wrong if we're not paying attention and paying attention now. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Excellent.